Hello, everyone. Welcome to this evening's presentation. Uh, this is the Financial Assistance Information Session with Catlin Gable School. We're so glad you could join us this evening. My name is Sarah Nordoff. I am the Assistant Head for Enrollment and External Relations here at Catlin, and I'm joined tonight by my colleague, Mary Jacob, who is the Director of Financial Assistance for Catlin. And uh, this event is being recorded, so you, just so you know, uh, we will post the recording to our website soon, so you can go back and listen again or share with colleagues and friends, um, but do know that we are recording tonight's event. Mary is going to walk through the financial assistance process with you tonight and share some tips on how to best navigate Clarity, which is our third-party uh, financial assistance application tool. Um, and uh, we will also respond to questions. So as you have questions while Mary is speaking, feel free to put those into the chat tonight and we will have moments throughout Mary's remarks where we'll pause and, and uh, answer as many questions as we can. Um, before I turn it over to Mary, I do just wanna say a quick word about Catlin Gable's commitment to financial assistance. We are a big believer that uh, a diverse student body is an essential component of an excellent education. And the only way to have a diverse student body with a tuition school like Catlin is to make sure that we are providing access for students and families to the school. Um, Catlin commits nearly 19% of its net tuition revenue to financial assistance every year. This is a sizable component of the operating budget for the school and um, a signal, I hope, to our commitment to financial assistance and to educational excellence. Uh, so with that said, I want to introduce Mary. Mary and I have worked together for over 10 years. She is um, absolutely an expert in this space. That is not an understatement. Um, and she uh, has some great expertise to share with you tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary. And just a quick reminder that we are Happy to address questions, put them in the chat as you think of them, and we'll get to them at certain moments along the way this evening. Thanks again for coming. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, appreciate your kind words. Uh, so I just wanted to um, just um, go further on what Sarah was saying um, with our commitment towards fa uh, financial assistance at the school. Um, this slide that you see here uh, represents a, sort of a snapshot of where we are right now in the current school year, 23-24. So the first thing I've done is I've listed my, our tuitions, our current tuitions for the different levels of school. Um, and right under that, you can see the average financial assistance that we give for our students. Um, so uh, that really illustrates um, you know, how much we are willing to bring in and um, commit to the all the families that we want to make our community the best it can be. Um, so average to uh, financial assistance is about 27,300 for this current school year. And that average tuition, um, average financial assistance has been awarded to families with incomes in this range, 22,000, almost 23,000 all the way up to 332,960. So th that's the income range that um, of our families who have been, uh, who are currently in our program. And um, in total assistance, we gave out over $5.5 .5 million um, to in all levels of financial assistance and in all grade levels from preschool all the way up to 12th grade. Um, and 26% uh, uh, between 26 and 28% uh, from year to year of our students receive financial assistance. So, um, you know, it is our goal uh, in the future to to keep that number going up to closer to 30%. So that would be uh, that's a goal we're constantly working on. Um, the pandemic did set us back a little bit, um, but uh, but that's definitely our vision for the program um, is to keep growing it. Um, and then um, something that we're going to talk about a little bit later in the in the presentation is average need met. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. But um, we we've on average covered about 98 percent of calculated need for for each uh, student. So we're pretty proud of that. So 
So I just want to go uh, real quickly over what is financial assistance actually, right? Um, as Sarah mentioned, it is um, based on our uh, financial assistance is a portion of our operating budget. So we are committed to that between 18 and 19 percent. And for schools like us, independent schools and private schools, that's on the high end. So we are we're pretty um, cutting edge on that aspect. We're a leader in that way. Um, and then we also have generous donors who contribute to the school's endowment. And that's also uh, where we get financial assistance every year uh, is a portion of the endowment that helps fund lots of programs. Um, so cap financial assistance in, in the first uh, bullet point is uh, it's tuition that is based on a, a family's financial need, right? So you see the published tuition that we have on our website, but not everybody can afford that. It's very expensive. So we have uh, tuition based on financial ease. So we calculate a tuition that fits your household and your needs. Um, and that is done via the a third party provider. It's called Clarity Financial Aid Application. And uh, this is our first year using them. So um, we're all on a learning journey together with this, but I will show a few tips about that later on. Um, and then we also have a financial assistance committee that um, that makes all the final decisions uh, for each application for each child that is admitted to the school and um, each child that is currently in the program. We do have other types of financial assistance. Um, we do have one uh, merit-based scholarship for those who qualify. We're not gonna talk a lot about that because the, it is not need-based, it's merit-based. Um, so there's been lots of other presentations and talks about that scholarship. Um, there are monthly payment plans available. So once you once you know your tuition is calculated and you are delivered that decision, you will have a number of options on how to pay that tuition, right? Um, one of which is a monthly payment plan uh, divided up over 10 months. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned, uh, the school's endowment provides additional assistance, somewhere around $200,000 for books and laptops and trips and global trips, um, lunch for those who qualify, learning center, all the different um, elements that make the Catlin Gable experience um, enriching and positive for every student. We want to provide you know, access to everything. We don't want, for example, um, a family to just barely afford tuition and then not be able to take part in any of the other offerings at Catlin Gable. So we we have these special special funds set aside uh, so that you will be able, your child will be able to uh, have the laptop because it's required in ninth grade and have the books that are required to attend their classes. And participate in all of the extra things that are um, that they want to, to participate in and or even try for the first time, right? What should you do to prepare? So, um, you know, this is going to be, you know, a kind of a deep dive into your uh, financial situation. So um, you're going to want to, uh, before you sit down, just sort of gather uh, some of your financial data for your house. Everything about your income, investments, that includes 529s, uh, taxes, some of your monthly and unusual expenses, debts, uh, information about your home value, your purchase price, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, one thing that you are going to want to do is include non-taxable income. So a lot of people forget, um, We uh, many of us have... Uh, pre-tax savings like our 401k and, and those kind of things, that's what we consider non-taxable income. So uh, when, when the quest, when the Clarity application asks you, do you have any non-taxable income? You should probably say yes. And then it'll give you places to put pre-tax savings out of your paycheck and things like that. Child support, um, social security insurance, things like that. Um, any kind of um, state benefits or federal benefits that you receive, all of that should go under non-taxable income. And then a tip for business owners, um, you know, a, 
a lot of times you, you know, if your business uh, doesn't fluctuate too much, you can just use um, a prior year with similar data, um, or you can use your quarterly statements if you're keeping up on those um, to, to pull together, to get yourself ready. And then one of the, the biggest pieces of advice that I uh, like to give is um, we're going to ask you how much can you afford towards tuition realistically. So one of the things that I suggest is that you look over your monthly budget, right? And determine of all of your income and all of your expenses, um, how much can you rearrange? How much can you reprioritize? Uh, how much can you eliminate in order to um, come up with the number that you feel comfortable with? And I want you to consider um, the sustainability in the long term, right? So uh, families are expected to continue paying um, the same general level of tuition for the duration of enrollment, unless there is a change of circumstances. Um, for example, um, you had one ch child enroll and then a, maybe a couple of years later, another child enrolls. So that would be a change of circumstances. Um, or, um, Maybe you have an older child that is going to go off to college, um, and that is a change of circumstances as well. So, um, so when when you are thinking about this, um, think about what is sustainable for your family in the long term. If it, you know, if you're applying for ninth grade, think about it as a four year commitment. If you're applying for kindergarten, you know, you're still a young family, and a lot's going to happen. But you know, think about the long term sustainability of that. Um, and it's an annual process. So, you know, we are, you know, allowing you to present your circumstances once a year, um, once you get into the program. And, you know, like I said, for a family with kin a kindergarten and, you know, a little one at home, you know, a lot's going to happen between then and 12th grade. So, you know, we definitely uh, work with families and and understand and, and try to adapt and, you um, work with families to make sure that they're able to sustain their tuition and that they have a level of tuition that works for them and the level of tuition that works for the school to um, to continue providing, you know, a healthy and strong program financially. We, we have to be able to plan and budget and um, and take care of all the families in the program. When should I submit my information? So um, we are aligning your financial assistance deadline with your admission application deadline, okay? So they're all due together. So if you're applying for the Palma Scholars Program in for ninth grade, then your financial assistance application is due on Tuesday, January 16th. Um, and if you are applying for... Uh, beginning of lower school, it's due on the 18th. Um, if you're applying for middle uh, six through 12, then it's due on February 6th. Um, if you have multiple applications, uh, just turn it in with your earliest application, uh, whichever one is first. Um, and I, I just wanna urge everyone, do not wait until after admission decisions are made to, uh, to apply or to let us know that you need it. Um, and, and also don't wait until the following year after you enroll to apply, unless you have a change of circumstances, as I mentioned. Um, that is not the way that we can, like I said, uh, maintain a strong and healthy program um, and financially sound if if there's if there's unpredictability in in the uh, assessments and and the needs of families that we can't that are unexpected. Um, you know, we certainly have unexpected situations, but these are the ones that we need to be able to look for and plan for. Um, so please don't miss your deadlines. Um, if if anything happens, all you have to do is um, send me an email um, and just let me know. Um, just missing the deadlines is not um, is not acceptable. So um, I have my email at the end and uh, I'm definitely available and happy to uh, accommodate um, as needed. So just let me know. How do I apply for financial assistance? So as mentioned, we have a, a third party provider, Clarity Financial Aid. Um, 
It's going to cost $60. It is automatically waived for families who meet the federal guidelines for free and reduced lunch. Um, the application itself will automatically waive it based on the information that you put in. Um, I will show you where to find all of the links um, uh, on our website, or um, you can get to them through your um, admission portal, uh, your Veracross admission portal too, as well. Um, a couple things I want to point out, uh, use the other considerations section. Uh, it's a whole section in the application. Uh, probably those of you who have started it, uh, you know, have seen this already. So this is a place where we, we would like for you to explain any special circumstances for your household. And um, that includes changes in income. So if you say, you know, you know, you're going to, we're going to see your 2022 um, income, and then you're going to estimate your 2023 income and even possibly project your 2024 income. And if we see a lot of variance in that, um, then it's a place for you to explain, you know, why you feel like your income is going to go up or down. Um, and then, you know, any other information that is not otherwise um, listed in the application or it's not asked for in the application. Um, and, and one of the things I want to really stress is if, if the committee, the financial aid committee is going to be able to consider your special circumstance, it's important that you list some kind of dollar amount that we would be able to plug in and recalculate, right? So if you said, well, I had, um, I'm expecting some extraordinary medical expenses in, in um, you know, coming up in the following year, and it's going to be about $5,000. That's the kind of information that will help me. Not, you know, if, I, if you just say, I just am expecting lots of medical ex bills, um, that's not, there's not much I can do with that to see if it will help you in the calculation at all. So, um, so just try to, just try to estimate it. Right. Um, or if one of your dependents or if one of your, you know, the grandparents in your family, if you're providing elder care or things like that, um, then just, just try to estimate and put something in there that the committee can like work with. Um, then, um, part of the application also is complete the verification step. So, um, one of the great tools about clarity, um, financial aid system is that uh it's going to just automatically retrieve your your 2022 tax documents from the IRS. So uh when we take a look at the application in a few minutes, um there are some places to make sure that you enter everything really um accurately um so that there won't be any uh hiccups in that process because um I'm sure you all know that the IRS is very specific about um, about matching everything up perfectly. So, um, and again, this is due with your application. The, the other part, once you fill out everything uh, and, uh, and then submit the fee, there's gonna be some documents required. So we do like to have at least two years worth of tax documents to look at. So you are gonna be required to upload um, your 2021 tax documents. And if you have W-2s to also upload those W-2s. The school may also ask for additional documents. If you um, have an S Corp or anything like that, we might ask for other uh, documents related to your business. Um, and then again, if for some reason, and it doesn't, and it hasn't happened too often because we've been using it now for about six months, um, there's a very small number of, of IRS retrieval that doesn't complete. So you would have to then upload your 2022 tax documents um, if that process doesn't finish. Um, and then, and you'll get a notification about that from Clarity. So, um, Hopefully it won't go in your junk mail, but they will notify you. Um, and, or I, I might uh, ask for it. Um, some of the checks that I do are um, before we really start um, crunching all the numbers is just making sure everybody has their documents uploaded and um, that no questions come up about um, 
about your information. Um, so we do some some sort of quality checks of, of that nature. Um, so you might either hear from me or Clarity um, about that kind of thing. Sarah, has there been any questions about anything so far that I can address? We do have some questions, Mary. Um, let me get to the top here. Uh, so, so first question is you've shared the average um, uh, financial aid amount. Is do we have a median number that we could share? I I don't have that calculated right now off the top of my head. Um, I really only track the average. Yeah. And is there any guidance for an income level at which point it's unlikely to receive financial assistance? Um, <clears throat> yes, and it, and it all depends on how many children that you're paying tuition for. So um, once you complete this application and it spits out a number, this household can afford X dollars. Um, if it's going all to one kid or if it's splitting up between two, three or four, then um, then there are some income levels where you're going to phase out of it. For example, on that very first slide, when you saw that the income level went all the way up to 300 and something thousand, if you only have one kid in tuition charging school, you're not going to qualify if you're only paying one tuition. So um, I'll, I'll um, bounce over to our uh, tuition and financial aid page um, and show you where to see um, we have some uh, tables that we have made and it shows levels of income for um, however many number of kids in tuition school. So school is closed tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so the, there's three charts here you can see. So the first chart is only one child in a tuition charging school. And these are actual uh, awards that we've made uh, in a three-year period. So as you can see, most of the awards are for one kid in tuition charging school are going to people right at about 175,000, right? Um, and then very few in the in three years, we made 11 awards for um, any amount above that. So that's going to be tapped out there. So when you see here two children in tuition charging school, you can see that in these higher income brackets, the, the awards are a lot more numerous. And then with three kids or more in tuition charging schools, there's not many with that many kids, right? So these numbers, the numbers are go a lot lower because, you know, three or more kids is not as common, right, as one or two. So you can see that there are, you know, people receiving awards at that level, but. Um, so this is a little bit helpful. These are actual awards. It There's many other factors included in these tables, um, but this is how we've chosen to illustrate it to sort of help you see where you might fit in, right? Um, and these are like average per student. So um, like I said, there's many other factors that fall into place here. Um, debts and assets and expenses and extraordinary circumstances, those are all baked in. So, um, so hopefully that's helpful for people. Great. Thank you, Mary. And a, a couple more questions. This next one I can, I can tackle. Uh, how does seeking financial assistance impact an application? Might a child who's denied financial assistance still be offered a place? The financial assistance committee and the admission committees are two separate entities. So we don't assess a child's admissibility with uh, their ability to pay tuition in mind. They're really two separate processes on purpose. Um, it is the case that when we ultimately make decisions on admitting students that we at times do need to take into account a family's um, financial assistance need. For the most part, we try to make decisions out of the gate um, with uh, without necessarily financial assistance as a major factor. Um, it depends on the tuition on the financial assistance budget for that year. Um, but where we get quite need sensitive is in the weight pool process. Um, so for students who 
apply to the school, they will receive either admission or wait pool or deny. Um, and for students in the wait pool, sometimes we have financial assistance money coming back in that we can give to a wait pool admit, and sometimes we don't. And so that's where it is quite a need sensitive process. But we also do not admit students who need financial assistance and not give it to them. So that is a practice of, that some schools do employ. We do not do that. We don't want to put families in the position of being so stretched. They really want to come to Catlin, but it's not a healthy situation to be so financially stretched where it's just an untenable situation um, in the future. So those are not decisions that we make. Um, Mary, just a couple more questions here and then we'll let you move on. Uh, uh, financial assistance, is it available to preschool applicants? Mm -hmm. Yes, we provide financial assistance for all grades. Um, we, um, over the last um, 10 years that Sarah and I have worked together, we have um, intentionally and thoughtfully um, rearranged our allocations to include younger grades. Um, at, when we started working together, 60% of the entire budget was in the upper school, nine, nine through 12. And now every uh, division has an equal relative proportion of the budget. Mary, what if you have a family with two households and one household is not... Um... Uh, is not wanting to fill out the financial assistance application. How do we handle that? Yeah. Well, um, it, it is a requirement. Um, it's it's the family's responsibility, whether you're married, never married, divorced, separated. Um, but if you're in two households, you're still parents and it is your responsibility financially. Our budget, our, our program is need-based. Um, so if Typically, it has worked where I could reach out to the other household and just provide some information, some reassurances. Um, but unless there are extraordinary circumstances, um, it is a requirement. And we do that for our own due diligence, right? So we have this, the, a large portion of the funds come from our own tuition paying families. So, um, uh, you know, representing them, we don't want a high earner to not pay and um, just because they're not willing. It's it's need-based. So um, extraordinary circumstances are considered, obviously. I mean, every family is different. Every family has um, their own story. But examples of extraordinary circumstances would be um, we've had a family, uh, a, a parent incarcerated. We've had a parent um, disabled. We'd have a parent um a, a danger to the health and safety of the family. And so they, um, the, the parent applying did not want us to contact them or stir up any trouble there. Um, so there, those are the examples of extraordinary circumstances. Um, you know, uh, in, in a lot of ways, joining the Catlin community should really be a joint decision for the parents, right? And so participating in the whole process is required. Um, and, you know, you can set up an appointment with me or um, we can schedule a Zoom or a phone call or you can email me and reach out to me and we can talk about your special circumstances. So, you know, we're definitely open and willing to to um, to listen. And and we we have made exceptions, as I as I mentioned. And Mary, one last question re related and then we'll let you keep going. Um if it is a if it is two households divorced or separated, do they create their own account, one account, or are they separate accounts when they apply? They're separate accounts. So one of the reassurances that I provide is that you would never have to share information with the other parent. It's all confidential. You don't see anything. They don't see anything. Um, I don't share anything, and Clarity won't share anything. Um, so. It's it's completely separate and secure, and the and you as a parent, if you're asked, you know, to fill it out. One of the other things I tell the person is, it's not compelling you to pay tuition. You know, filling this out does not make you pay tuition. So, it's for assessment purposes, um, and hopefully, you are combining into a joint. Um, decision to send your child to Catlin Gable and, um, but yeah, but it's all going to be confidential. 
Great. Thanks, Mary. We'll let you keep going. Okay. So I wanted to share a little bit about how financial assistance is calculated. So once you fill out the uh, clarity application, uh, the whole purpose of it is to determine what your discretionary income is. And uh, this is just a quick summary of how Clarity uh, determines that. So they determine your discretionary income by first pulling together all of your taxable and non-taxable income. They automatically, automatically subtract your taxes paid. And then the next step is adjusted cost of living for the Portland metro area. So that gives you a little bit of help there. Um, after that, there is subtract, they, they subtract essential and other allowable expenses. So housing, food, medical, childcare, those kinds of things. Um, and I have to just mention that um, once you put your actual expenses in there, uh, there, there are limits, right? So there, and that's based on your family size. So a family size of three or four would have, uh, you know, a maximum housing, maximum food, maximum uh, in all these categories. Uh, and it would be a little more if you're a family of five or six, right? So, um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and then, um, then the last step is that it's going to add what they call an income adjustment based on how many assets you have, right? So if you have, um, you know, home equity, uh, other investments like 529s or maybe other kind of investments, um, whatever you have in cash, um, minus your debts. So assets minus debts. Um, debts, uh, allowable debts include things like parent student loans, medical debt, some, some amount of credit card debt, not all of your credit card debt. Um, so, uh, so based on how much that number is, it will take us a percentage of that number if it's positive it's a if it's a positive number not everybody has home equity and and uh and investments and all that and and so it wouldn't take anything um so part of that income adjustment part of that percentage is there's some um there's some calculation built in where the the closer you are to retirement the the more uh it the more uh the less it takes of that percentage, right? So preserving your assets, the closer you get to retirement. Um, and so then that after all those steps, your discretionary income is decided. And then from that discretionary income in step two here on the slide, it will slice off about between 22 and 42%, depending on how much that uh, level of discretionary income is, right? So higher means higher percentage, lower means lower percentage. Um, and, and, and it's taking just a slice. So essentially your family isn't gonna pay every single dime of your discretionary, discretionary income to tuition, right? It's just saying you need to prioritize tuition and we're just gonna take that first. And then with all the rest of your discretionary income, you know, you still as a family, as a household, have the ability to make choices, right? With, with your other money, you know, saving for retirement, taking vacation, all those good things um, that you still probably want to do. Um, so then, um, as I mentioned, the suggested tuition is divided up among all the kids in tuition charging schools. Um, so if that's uh, one kid at Catlin, two kids at Catlin, one kid at Catlin, one kid at college, one kid at Catlin and one kid in daycare. Um, if both parents are working, uh, you know, we count that. So, uh, but Catlin is going to be probably more than in daycare. So that we're going to um, prorate that more heavily to Catlin Gable, but college is probably more expensive than Catlin Gable. So we're going to prorate that less towards Catlin Gable. So, um, so it just depends on the expenses of of which kids are in, in tuition charging schools. And then um, the final step is uh, the finance financial assistance committee um, just verifies everything, updates everything. Um, and then um, 
once we feel like everybody's calculations are what they should be, um, considering all the special circumstances, um, we use our professional judgment to make any adjustments that we feel are compelling and that we feel are warranted. Um, and then we finalize our award decisions. And I say decision, right? Based on our policies and available budget. Um, Cause sometimes your decision could be that you don't qualify. And so we would deliver that decision. Um, and I just wanna mention um, as a heads up, uh, we one of my quality checks that I do go through to just stay ready and stay um, uh, on top of things for decision day is that if you don't qualify, uh, we will give you a, a heads up email just so you know um, in advance and then you can decide if you wanted to continue with the process. This will be in mid to later February um, and just give you a chance to absorb that information, right? So, um, you know, in past years, we would deliver great news and disappointing news all in one day. And, um, and that was hard for families to do. Um, so we have in the, in the last many years been doing it this way, just to give people a heads up and not surprise them on decision day. Um, and a lot, and, and there's families who rec you know, a lot of families say, oh yeah, we, we knew we wouldn't qualify or it just gave them a chance to think about it and, um, and just really, uh, consider how they wanted to proceed forward. So. This is an example um, that I wanted to show everyone uh, about kind of how the process works a little bit. So um, Catlin Gable strives to meet up to 95% of calculated need. And this is uh, what I mentioned in that first slide. Um, uh, about meeting need. So um, if you look at the first the first calculation here, we first financial need is determined, okay? So uh, I'm using the example of the published tuition for middle school this for this current year, 39,100. So when all is said and done, uh, your suggested tuition via clarity for this example is 12,000. That's what they said that your household could pay. And so when you subtract that from the tuition, your total financial need is 27,100. So that's your that's the gap in what you can afford and what the published tuition is. So then um, we take that information and we create a financial assistance decision from the Catlin Gable, right? So again, that's 39,100 published tuition we adjust that financial need to about 95%. And so your need is recalculated to 25,750. So we gap it by about 5%. Um, and so your total need-based tuition would then be 13,350. And like I said, there are payment plans available. And that 5% that we could possibly, you know, save on each student allows us to serve more students uh, without stretching families overly. Um, and uh, it, it, it really has worked. But like I said, in that first slide, we've all, we've actually already um, exceeded that to 98% as an average, um, as average calculation. So that's pretty, that's pretty good news for families. Um, I'm going to pause one more time to see if there's any questions about this slide. Thanks, Mary. There's There are a couple of questions that have come in, some related to the slides, some we just haven't had a chance to get to. Um, in, Clar in the Clarity platform, it asks if after school care at Catlin is needed, does this impact the assessment for financial assistance? What if after school care is needed but unsure at this point if the after school will be at Catlin or versus other after care options? Yeah. Um, you know, um, that question's a little bit confusing and I apologize for that because I'm the one who created that question. Um, one of the things that's helpful for me to know that is because for our younger younger families with, with kids applying to preschool and kindergarten, um, part of the uh, financial assistance decision, I, I wanna make sure that I'm not, 
that I'm that I, that the family understands there's additional fees, right? There's additional cost. So, um, you know, Catlin only goes till a certain amount of time, like three o'clock. And I and if both families are working, if both sorry, both parents are working outside the home. I just want to know if you're both working and you're going to make use of it um, because uh, it will be helpful for me to know um, that we don't currently have financial assistance for after school care. It's not available. So I just want to, if you need it, I just want to know like yes or no, because uh, I, I will take that into consideration that you're going to, you're going to have those extra fees, right? Uh, we can't always bake it into your award, but sometimes we can a little bit take it into consideration. Um, so I apologize for that being confusing. Thanks, Mary. Um, this question is, are expenses a number that Clarity generates or is it data that families provide? Expenses are put in by the family. So um, it's going to ask you what what are your expenses for housing, for transportation, for food? for insurance, for medical. So it's gonna it's gonna have a list of things. And then it's gonna have a space, right? For And those are sort of your regular monthly expenses. And then there's another section that are sort of additional expenses that you experienced or that you will be experiencing. Um, and, the, and so those are things like maybe elder care or childcare or, um, you know, you had, I don't know, moving expenses, you know, things like that, that aren't a regular, normal monthly thing. Um, so there's places for you to just to describe them and put those in. And then the committee considers all of those. Yeah. Great. And one last question, and then we'll let you keep going. Um, are retirement assets like 401k, IRA, et cetera, included in discretionary income calculation? That's a very good question. Um, Calp and Gable does not include them. Um, that's our policy. So uh, we do ask about it just because it gives us a window into your financial health, a picture into your financial health and um, and where you are, right, as a family. Um, but it is not in the calculation. Um, other non-retirement investments are. Uh, you. One thing you shouldn't do is tell us that non-retirement assets are those are for my retirement. If they're not in a qualified retirement plan, then they're going to be considered as part of the calculation. Um, so it has to be in a 403B or, or an IRA or a 401k. If it's in those uh, vehicles, then it's not, it's not it, part of calculation. Thanks, Mary. We'll let you keep going. Okay. So I'm going to um, pop over to Clarity and just go over a couple of tips and tricks. So uh, it gives everybody a little bit of a, a help in filling out the application. Hopefully a lot of you are well down the road to it. So when you first open it up, you're gonna see your dashboard here. So um, when you first create your account and sign in, you're gonna have, uh, it's gonna start, say start application right here on this button. Otherwise, um, it will say, at, if you've started it and come back to it, it will always say edit application. Um, and here is your document requests. So everybody should be should be seeing these two items uh, as a document request. Probably for most people, that's all you're gonna see. Um, like I said, if you're, if you're a business owner with an S Corp or partnership or anything like that, then you might see some additional uh, form requests here. And if for any reason your 2022 um, retrie IRS retrieval didn't complete, then you'll see that request here for your 2022 uh, 1040 and W-2s. Um, another thing that I wanted to show you is over here is your help button. And there's a lot of great resources there. Um, There's, uh, and these were created by Clarity. Um, you can search for terms. You, you can just go to the basics, but they're pretty helpful. Um, I'm also gonna, I, I've also listed some resources in on our website, which I'll show you as well. 
So I wanted to, so you have all your students going to be listed down here and the schools that they've applied to. I just have one test kid and one school. Um, and then you can see your summary of all your deadlines. Um, also here under documents, you can see uh, if you're applying to multiple schools that use cl the Clarity platform, you're going to see here um, for this these documents, how many schools are requiring it. But one of the things to remember is all you have to do is upload it one time. Even if you are applying to three schools and all three of them want it, you just upload it one time and it comes to all of us. So that's kind of um, a handy tip. Um, so I'm gonna go into edit application. And under parent guardian information is, um, is something that I just wanted to emphasize. So um, ultimately, for the purposes of that IRS tax retrieval and having everything match up nice and perfectly for the IRS, um, you want to put here, it's, it specifically says your legal first name. So if if you go by Eddie, but your name is really Edward, um, you, you really need to put Edward down here and your legal last name, even if you um, if, if you go by a, a certain last name. Um, but in reality, it's like hyphenated or something like that. You have to put the legal uh, last name. Um, and then the other question is, did you, um, it's not on this page. It's going to say, did you, um, what was the last address? Did you file taxes at a different address? So it's on the next page. Um, and if you said yes, then it's going to ask you, to put that in here and it has to match uh, as i as i said to what the irs had so those are two places that will really streamline um the the tax process um for for getting those 2022 taxes and then you won't have to upload those um the other section is the student applicants so in this section, you're only going to put applicants um, that you're applying for financial aid, right? So um, if you're applying for one kid or two kids, all of them are going to be listed here. What you don't want to do, so there's the next section, is other dependents. So you don't want to put your applicants, because you might say to yourself, well, they're my dependents too, so I'm going to put them here. You don't want to do that um, because then you're going to duplicate them. So everybody gets gets their own category. You're either a parent guardian, applicant, or dependent. You can't be more than one of those categories. So please keep that in mind. When you go, uh, when you put your student applicant in, I'm sorry, I'm just going to go backwards one little step. Um, you can select the schools here. So you can add, keep adding schools if you want to. And it's just like a, a search. Um, Clarity Academy is in here. So you can click that. Um, and then, you know, you can add as many schools as are available in Clarity, uh, according to what I'm told. So there really isn't a limit. Um, and then here's that question. What is the amount your household can realistically afford to contribute? towards tuition. So um, that's a number that, you know, you should be very thoughtful about. Um, just be very careful what you put there. And that hopefully you'll get that as an annual amount. I asked you to look kind of at your monthly budget, but then multiply it and by 10 or 12 and um, put that, that's the number that should be put there. Um, the other um, thing that I wanted to talk about is the income section. So under financials. Um, so under total salary and wages, um, you're going to want to put only W-2 income here. These little um, info bubbles are really helpful. So always hover over it and see what it has to say, right? Um, there's a lot of people who say, oh, my salary is, you know, from my business. So they put the, they put the information there. And then when they say, put your business information, then they put it in again. 
Uh, so then you've doubled your income. So this is only for W-2 income. Um, as you can see here, this bubble for self-employment income, this application is a lot better than our old one because you wouldn't be able to see them right there together. So people aren't going to make that mistake as, as often. Um, but honestly, some people do issue themselves a W-2 from their business. So you would have W-2 income if you, if you indeed issue yourself or your spouse a W-2. So that income would go there. Um, and then there's a place here. You just put other taxable income. You just title it, put the value like you got a refund, right? And you can say 500 and then save and continue. And then here's the place where you can put non-taxable income. So um, like I said, here is a place where you can go ahead and put that pre-tax savings. Um, child support, social security is sort of pre-loaded here for you. Um, and uh, here's another thought bubble. <laughs> uh, please include only the non-taxable component of social security income. So on your actual um, 1040, it breaks it down into the taxable and non-taxable. So that, that's where you would find that information to, to place here. And then, like I said, here's another uh, place you can just keep adding other, like if you got gift money and you can say, I got $10,000 maybe, and then save and continue. So it's pretty customizable to your own situation, right? Um, for, for any of those sort of, um, unusual things. Um, this is super helpful. Uh, the rent and mortgage costs here, it's just its own space. And then the rest of these are really great. Like you could just slide over and um, just put, you know, basic amounts, right? Um, and then this child support section is what you're paying, not what you've receiving as income, right? So um, be careful of that student loan payments, those have resumed for all of us, yikes. <laughs> so we'll, I'll start seeing a lot more of these going forward, I'm sure. So this is super, um, super easy, super user-friendly. And then you could just save and continue. And then this is, as I mentioned, those, so th those sliders go uh, to describe your sort of regular monthly expenses. And then this is that sort of other out-of-pocket expenses. So you can, um, I went ahead and, and listed medical and I put an amount here and a description. I not, you can add another one. There's some pre-entered uh, ones, but you can enter your own, right? So I had um, roof repair, right? And I'm going to say that was 7,000. Save and continue. So you can put, oh, it's required. Save and continue. So it's it's super customizable. And so all of those expenses um, can, can be considered in, in that calculation that I showed you about grabbing your discretionary income. Um, there are, we do put limits on some of them, like maximums based on your family size. And then other ones that, um, that we'll consider. We might not take all of them, but we'll consider. We'll look at them and make that determination. Um, so then I, I said early on uh, in the background section, um, I'm just going to go back real quick. It, this, this background section is as the second step. Um, it's going to ask you questions here so that the, the application will only give you the questions that pertain to you, right? I said I owned a home, so it then gave me those questions. If I'm only renting, those questions would not come to me, right? So I don't have to bother with putting zeros and managing all that. So it they kind of designed it a little bit kind of like TurboTax, where it asks you those upfront questions, and then it knows kind of what to how to deal with you. I said I didn't own a business, so it's not gonna ask me any questions about that. But if you do say yes, that's gonna come up, right, in the, in the process. 
So that's why I, I received those, um, at those home questions. So tell us, tell us about my home. So, um, so I did, I put all that in. Um, and it, again, there's these cool, uh, sliders. So you don't have to have maybe exact numbers. You can just say, oh, it's within this range. And that's, that's really good. So I'm just going to save that. And then it'll ask about vehicles. You can put all that in there. You can keep adding them if you want to. There's always going to be add that you know this button to add it so that you can like fully give us the picture um, of you of what you want. And like I said, this is that where we collect the information about retirement accounts. But um, in our we uh, on our side, the school side of the the clarity uh, process. We've already put in our policy and rules, and it says for all applicants, do not include retirement accounts. So we've we've just set that up across the board in uh, in our process. Now that's just for Catlin Gable. Other schools that you're applying to have their own policies and guidelines. So um, that's something that you're going to want to think about um, and look into, possibly ask in there in their webinar or in their, uh, from their uh, financial assistance person uh, about what they do. Um, and like I said, you can just keep adding assets. You can add 529s here and say, you know, I've got some money for this kid. Um, oh, that's its own question, sorry. Forget, like I said, we're still, we're on the beginning of our journey here too. So now we remember that's a separate question. So this is the part where we, we talk about liabilities. So um, so there's credit cards and student loans and unpaid medical. Those are the sort of the, um, the ones that Clarity has decided to call out because they're pretty common, right? Um, and these little bubbles are again, very helpful. And then you can always add other additional. So um, some people have personal loan. I decided to just put that in here as an example, but you can add other kinds of debt and describe it. Um, and and try to be specific because it, it helps us when we're reviewing your application. Trash that. So this is where I mentioned the other considerations. Um, so this is where, you know, if you say, um, you know, I'm expecting some extraordinary medical bills, um, or my spouse, uh, lost income for two months when he was recovering from surgery, things like that. He lost two months of income at, and it was, you know, 4,000 a month. So $8,000. So that would be like a, an example of something uh, specific to put in this field. Um, and then any other information that you want to be considered. So um, in, in this case, uh, there's not going to be any other parents. So this is helpful when, when I say, oh, I only have one parent filling out an application for this child or only one parent is listed. And if I see this, I'll be like, Oh, then this is a one parent household. It's not a two parent household. So um, that's helpful for me. And I'm not going to go and email this parent and say, you know, give me some contact information. Where's the other parent, you know, and ask a lot of questions that I should, you know, it's not necessary for me to ask because I have the information right here. I am, this is just a test, so I'm not going to pay anything, but this, and then the submit button. Um, so you can see here, uh, it's super helpful. All these purple check marks mean that I have everything all checked off, um, except for those last two, which I'm not going to do. <laughs> um, and the other thing that I just wanted to mention about Clarity is um, there's a lot of parents who are and all parents should be uh, worried about their data security. This is a lot of very personal, confidential information. And um, I just wanted to mention in, in my in, in our investigation of, of adopting Clarity, our IT 
uh, director asked a lot of questions about data security, and um, she was satisfied that that they um, are careful and have enough protections and have enough um, redundancy and checks and balances and um, access controls. Uh, so it's it's very secure. Your information will be secure. And you as an applicant have the ability to um, take things out of here if you want to. So you would just have to request it and we would I would open it back up and you could delete things out of it. So you just rest assured, have control of this and you can um, ha have it handled the way you want. Um, there's multi-factor factor authentication for both you and me. When I access this, I have to do multi-factor um, authentication. So, um, you know, I think on their website, they have more information about it if you wanted to read more about it, but I just wanted to just put that out there um, because we did our own research as a school and our IT director asked a lot of questions. Um, and, and I know Clarity is also ha happy to answer questions about that as well. So, um, I just wanted to go back one more time and show you here. So on our website, um, our, our uh, tuition and financial assistance page, sorry about that. <laughs> so this is a, a, a page where you can get a lot of information. Uh, over here on this right-hand navigation is where I showed you those tuition, uh, average tuition. Um, there's a policy and eligibility page, which has a lot of information. Uh, there's some financial assistance questions, uh, FAQs that are um, can be very helpful. Um, and then the apply for financial assistance page is right here at the top. And this is where you can find the links. So step one, complete the Clarity app. And here's the link right here. And then some additional helpful information. Um, submit that your personal information in that other considerations. And then upload your documents. Um, and then here is where you can find additional sources. And I went ahead and provided direct links to things that I think families would find really helpful. Um, so there's a family application guide and it's super helpful. It, it kind of goes step by step and it's also in Spanish. And then uh, this quick reference guide, I think is pretty helpful, which is also in Spanish. Um, that help button on your dashboard that I showed you, um, you can search for uh, key terms and things. And then here is their email and phone support. And right now they have a, uh, they have uh, customer service hours uh, on six days a week. So, oh no, seven days a week, they told me. So, and that's because this is sort of the busy season. So they they are. And then this is the webinar that they did. You just have to put this passcode in. Um, they did a multiple ones of these. This is the one that, they've, um, that they're sharing uh, that you can uh, review with them. It's just a recording though, it already happened. Um, so this, this page, the apply page is, is super helpful. Um, so I just wanted to show you that. Um, so I'm just gonna see from Sarah, if there's any more questions about any of that or anything else, I'm happy to answer. Thanks, Mary. Two more questions for 1099 contractors that um, whose income varies significantly year to year. Is there a place to provide a detailed explanation of 2024 income that will be different than 2023? Yes, please put that in the other considerations section. And uh, let me just say, um, you know, we have in our program, there are many business owners. I mean, we're very familiar uh, with working with people who are self-employed. And, um, you know, a lot of them do have fluctuations in their income from year to year. And uh, one of the things that we do uh, or that we can do is um, set like a, 
uh, an income, uh, an average income over the last three or four years and kind of use that as a baseline, right? And then in, you know, after three years, we'll relook at it and reset it again if your business is continuing to fluctuate. So it's just sort of a, a placeholder. It's like a baseline for us to, um, to work with because one of the things that we don't want to do is have a roller coaster ride on financial assistance, right? For you and for us and our budget, right? <laughs> so um, it's easier to do adjustments every few years with an average rather than follow that uh, roller coaster from year to year. Hopefully that's helpful. Thanks, Mary. And the, and the last question is around um, clarity on where to put retirement and clarity, clarity on clarity um, in terms of where to, <laughs> to put retirement yeah. and where not yeah. to put. Under the, in the asset section, there's a, there's a field specifically labeled retirement account. Uh, or retirement funds. Uh, and like I said, you should only put in there what is in a qualified retirement account, right? Don't put anything that you've earmarked as retirement. Just right. anything that's already in a 401k or 403b or an IRA or Roth IRA, you know, those are the things. That's what the only thing that goes in there. And like I said, those are protected from the calculation for our guidelines. Great. On it. Oops. Um, Mary, are the um oh, that question I guess was rescinded. Um, do we calculate school year as 10 months or 12 months? Um, well, the tuition is what we're doing. With clarity, we're calculating for tuition. So that covers 10 months. Right. Okay. Payments actually start. Um, you know, decisions go out on March 8th, uh, contracts are due March 20th, I believe. And your first bill is going to go out April, first week of April, and it's due May 1st, if you're in the 10 month payment plan. And the, the reason for that is that, um, all, all tuition is collected by December. Right. And right. So your so the ten month plan goes from April to December, and then um, we have a quarterly payment plan, also finished by December, and um, and the one time payment, which is in in June, billed in June, due July one. So um, so yeah, the tuition cut. This process covers tuition. Anything else that's outside of tuition is handled separately. Right. And then can you repeat, Mary, what you said about reopening the application if someone needs to update it? Yes. So um, once uh, an application is calculated and reviewed and a decision is rendered, um, I have the ability to lock that application uh, because we don't want any changes coming in after everything is finished and it's closed, right? Uh, cause we're not, uh, there's no reason for me to go back to it. So I wouldn't see it. So if you need to make a change, you have to uh, contact me and then we'll talk about it. We'll say, is that, you know, is the, is it worth reopening the file? Is it significant enough? You know, um, one of the things about, uh, this process is, you know, it's annual, right? And we understand changes are going to happen, but we can't, we can't just keep opening a file over and over and over again. So we just do it once a year. We catch changes once a year. But if if you needed to talk to me about it, then we we definitely can discuss it and we can definitely open it up if, if it's needed. Great, thanks, Mary. And the last question that's come in is under on um, businesses. When it asks for value of business assets, liabilities, is that your specific ownership portion or the total business assets liability? I believe, um, and again, um, I can check and triple check about it, but I believe it's the business. And then there is a place that you put your ownership stake and then clarity calculates based on that percent ownership. Great. Those are all the questions, Mary. Fantastic. Well, up here, I have uh, some 
basic information about where to get help, just some reiterating some uh, information that I've shown you, um, but just summarized it here. Um, this slide and this slideshow and the recordings will be uh, posted on um, the financial assistance page, uh, tuition and financial assistance page. In about a week, it takes uh, our team that much time to kind of pull it all together. Um, so you can review it again and uh, view the slides again as well. So, um, so just look for that uh, next week sometime. And like I said, if you need time to, um, if, if there's any reason that you need to uh, get an extension on your financial assistance, just let me know, just contact me. I'm very reasonable. <laughs> I can attest to that. Thanks, Mary. And thank you all so much for coming tonight. We appreciate your participation and your great questions and engagement. And uh, as Mary mentioned, we'll post the recording as soon as possible, hopefully next week, weather dependent. I hope everybody stays safe and warm and um, has a, a really nice uh, long weekend. Take care, everybody.